Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to the work session for Black Eyed Susan Day, May 18th, and uh, uh, 2015. We have a pretty full agenda. We've had a little bit of audio issues, so thank you for bearing with us as we a little bit behind getting started here. Um, but first up is uh, discussion of the Maryland Broadband with Amanda Pollock and, and Drew Van Drop. Van Dop. I'm sorry tongue-tied today. If you want to come up and join us, they are, we do want to make sure, I, oh, Julie's going to, you can, yeah, I'm just, I'm just you can talk from your seat. In, oh. As long as you get close to the microphone is all I was going to ask is that you're aware of that because they had to turn it down due to some of the issues we're having. Okay. Yeah, um, I've had the opportunity to work uh, for the past couple of weeks with um, Drew Van Dopp from Maryland Broadband Cooperative and Amanda Pollock um, on this great opportunity for Salisbury. Um, for downtown and for uh, the, the wider community um, to bring broadband, high speed, high, high speed internet. Um, and uh, I'm, I don't know how aware everybody is um, on what it offers, but it, it opens many doors on, uh, you know, a number of industries that can come here and, and call Salisbury home and, and bring um, a lot of new opportunities here. Um, and so Drew and Amanda can speak to the uh, more technical side of it, but um, with the with the streets opening up here soon, hopefully, um, it's the perfect time to to jump on this. Um, so. yeah, that that was our feeling. You can come on up. Um, yeah. The my main question about this is when Jake and I met with you back in March and brought this forward to the administration. Um, once we got past the resistance, there was a, a feeling that the number that we had was much, much lower. I don't remember the exact number, and I looked back through to try to find that, but it was somewhere, it was less than 30,000, and we were under the impression it would not require any budget amendments or change orders or, or anything like that. Um, then the resistance went away, and now the mayor has announced that he's supporting it, but the price tag is $197. So I'm trying to figure out what changed between March and now besides the mayor's mind. Sure. Well, if you want, maybe first we can tell you a little bit about what broadband is and then go into what's into those costs, okay. if that's okay. Um, Drew has a, a brief presentation just to tell you about Maryland Broadband Cooperative. So it might be good to start with that as background, and then we'll get into those costs. I think we need costs. to connect those. <laughs> And if that doesn't work, we can just oh, talk off. We may have to go out of the present. <coughs> oh, no, that was just oh, okay. All right, well, we'll just, we'll, let's see. Imagine that. <laughs> Aren't you handy? Johnny on the spot. Plug the right thing for you. That's right. That's always my solution. Restart it. <laughs> it's amazing how many times that's the right answer. Sometimes it's the only answer. Mine gets so jammed up because I've got 20 things going at once on there all the time. Yeah. And it's like, no more. And still, I don't take the message. Please stand by for technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can talk off of it. It's not a long time. Yeah, no, it's not. It, actually, if, if you all don't mind, do you mind if I go stand at the podium? Because it's, I prefer to be able to see everybody. Yeah, that's fine. Do my introductory remarks. That's Thank fine. You. Um, we all have it in our <coughs> packet as well. The same presentation in the packet? Yes. Yes. <coughs> If 
we can get it up for the folks at home, that's fine. If not, okay. it's okay. It's available online in the briefing booklet. Oh, um, it can like can we have the remote for the projector? Do you have the remote for the projector? Um, okay. uh, Julia has it. No, that's the that's the that's clicker for the that's the present. Oh no, oh, for the projector? Yeah, for yeah. the projector. <laughs> you want it off? No, no. Is there an input button? Switched. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. <coughs> okay. So. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Drew Van Dump. I'm with the, the Maryland Broadband Cooperative. And uh, uh, we were invited in to um, uh, uh, provide some insight and some information uh, from our area of expertise on what might be facing the city if the city wanted to take advantage of the current opportunity with the streetscape project. And uh, so we were very happy to do that. I just wanted to take a couple of moments to uh, introduce what the Maryland Broadband Cooperative is, uh, how we work in the community and across the state of Maryland, and uh, provide some information about fiber optic and uh, broadband technologies, uh, why the, the, the medium is important, and uh, what it can possibly mean to your community and, and what other communities across the, uh, the country are doing. Um, first, let me tell you a little bit about the Maryland Broadband Cooperative. We are a 501c12 nonprofit. Uh, we were formed in 2006, and uh, our members were formed under the Consumer Cooperative Act of the state of Maryland. And uh, I think it's, it's always important, even though we have Maryland in our name and the flag in our logo, that we always like to point out to people that we are not, uh, not only are we not a part of the state of Maryland, we are not a public sector entity. We are a private sector, not for profit. Um, we are uh, driven by our members. Uh, we started out uh, with five members back in 2006, the five tri-county councils, and we now have over 90 members. Uh, about a third of our members are public sector entities, um, such as county governments, school districts, municipalities, uh, not-for-profit, healthcare, and educational groups. But the lion's share of, of our members, um, almost 60, are uh, for-profit internet service providers of all shapes and sizes, from uh, fledgling you know, entrepreneurial ISPs to uh, franchise uh, cable operators to wireless internet service providers to some of the largest corporations in America. And the way our model is set up is we are in, uh, a regional open <coughs> access middle mile provider, meaning it's our job to use the, um, uh, the backbone assets that we have either built or come to control. Uh, to bring world-class internet services from the internet access points in Baltimore and Northern Virginia out into rural communities. Uh, we do not provide uh, retail services to individual residents or small businesses. Our model is one where we provide the wholesale internet to our ISP members who they in turn provide direct services to residents and small businesses. And uh, and the way the paradigm is supposed to function is that when Maryland Broadband becomes involved in a community or in an area, it's not like having a single ISP entrant come into, um, come into the, uh, the local marketplace, but rather more than 50 um, are now available to support uh, business development. Um, as I said, we were, actually it's kind of interesting, Friday was our ninth anniversary. And we have grown significantly uh, in the last nine years, not only in our membership, uh, but in our span and reach. We now uh, own or control over 1,600 miles of backbone. 
Uh, we have uh, uh, 26 points of presence, uh, which are facilities um, not unlike a, a Verizon central office, but where, you know, an enclosed facility where we have our, our long haul uh, equipment and uh, where we bring services into communities. We have 26 of them now across the state of Maryland, here in Maryland and in Virginia. And uh, we are able to um, uh, bring, and uh, Julia mentioned it, uh, super high speed internet services into rural communities. Um, not merely one gig or five gig or 10 gig, but our backhaul network actually has the technical capability of carrying 100 gigabit services. And although we don't have anybody that's asked for that today, I think that it's, it's important that, um, uh, that you know that as the economy and the needs of, of businesses and, and individuals scale over time, usually much faster and broader than our capability to predict, that, uh, that we have the kind of backbone and, and network design that would allow for as much growth as our community might want. Um, why is fiber important? Um, fiber optic cable as a transport medium uh, allows for uh, those types of speeds and capabilities which simply cannot be physically supported by, by copper and, uh, and coax. Um, copper and coax can do amazing things and have done amazing things. Uh, but the, the analogy I like to use is that, you know, there was a time when, uh, you know, we had ferries that, uh, that got us across the Chop Tank and the Kent Narrows and across the Bay. And we figured out a way to live with that and to work around it, and it worked. But the current bridge system is preferable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the difference between fiber optics and cable. In fact, um, we do a lot of work uh, supporting uh, members that provide services to uh, the cell companies that operate on the Eastern Shore. And, you know, one of the dividing lines is that when uh, cell providers need to support 4G and higher services, you simply have to have a fiber optic connection all the way to the tower site in order to support that. Um, and then there's a lot of things about uh, that, uh, that fiber allows people much smarter than me to be able to do, but they, they can actually use the varying colors and bands of light to th send millions of multiple signals across a single band of glass. And, uh, um, and again, it's, it's just the, uh, the architecture that, that you need to, uh, to support the higher end applications that, are, that seem to be continually coming down the pipe. Um, it was really interesting uh, to be invited in to talk to uh, the folks here in the city because uh, Salisbury is not alone in looking at building out a fiber optic infrastructure within its municipality. Um, from Palm Coast, Florida to Chattanooga, Tennessee to Santa Monica, California, at least 135 similar uh, municipalities across the country are either, ha either have built or are building similar network grids to the one being considered by the city of Salisbury. Um, typically, the cities that are doing this kind of thing are small to medium-sized cities uh, spread out across 37 states. Um, and of course, you know, that, that information may have changed here recently to, as, as more cities look at this. And it's not just smaller cities, but larger cities too. Both Seattle and Chicago are um, in the process of working large build-outs because whether you're in Chicago or in a small town or a smaller city like Salisbury, the people that lead those cities see similar problems. That's, a, that's one of the things, you know, Maryland Broadband, our focus is on bringing services into uh, rural areas, and that's always been our mission, our, our mantra. But it's amazing to me whenever I meet with folks that represent the city of Baltimore, when I hear that folks in Baltimore have unserved and underserved capability issues just like places in, that you would anticipate in, in, in rural areas. Uh, so these, the, the, the issues that are trying to be addressed here in Salisbury are, are, are common across the country. Um, but these cities are investing in fiber optic infrastructure because they see things in their community. They see areas that are stagnating either economically or socially. They see incumbent service providers that are either 
satisfied with how things are or unresponsive to changing needs. And they also, um, they also see job and employment opportunities, um, entrepreneurial growth opportunities that choose other communities and not theirs. And, and that's really, um, I think, the forward-looking part of what the city is contemplating now is, is to be on the list of cities that are considered as opposed to the list of cities that are not. Um, and then, of course, the other question is, all right, why do it now? And, uh, and again, Julia mentioned the fact that uh, you have an extraordinary opportunity with the streetscape project coming up where the single most expensive part of any infrastructure development project or especially fiber optic is opening up the earth and closing it back up again. And you're already doing that with the other three utilities. So it, it could be considered a, an opportunity missed to not take advantage of this uh, moment to do so for fiber optic cable as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, the, because it's so expensive um, uh, to, to open up the earth that if, uh, if it's not done now, when you have all of those advantages, it's a possibility that it may never be done. So um, that's what I wanted to, uh, to mention today and just kind of introduce uh, what fiber optics can do. Um, you know, the other thing that, you know, that you would hope is that once it's complete, and uh, that uh, uh, Salisbury will be in that list of the other cities that now have the physical infrastructure that would allow a company that needs super high bandwidth in order to operate, uh, that they can, they can consider downtown Salisbury as a suitable place to um, either grow or establish their business. So uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy. Okay. And Go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll wait. And, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, just to echo these comments, so what you have before you today is an MOU with Maryland Broadband. And essentially the gist of this is that the city would install all this fiber infrastructure as part of the Main Street Master Plan. As you all know, that wasn't part of the original scope, so it was not included in any of our um, previous discussions. But it essentially consists of a four inch uh, high density polyethylene conduit running down the street and then services coming off of that with the fiber inside. Uh, so Maryland Broadband is laying out the design for us so that we know where the infrastructure needs to go, where they need handholds, where services will go. Uh, and they provided for us a cost estimate. And that goes back to your original question. I think when it was first discussed in very preliminary terms, you, you had a much lower number in mind, and I think that was really the cost of four-inch conduit, I believe. Um, the numbers we're looking at now are the total cost to install, so materials and labor for the conduit and the fiber optics. So this, the, the prices that you're seeing in this package are, are the, entire, the entire cost to install. The number that we had, as I understood it, was the fiber 144 strand, I think it was, or 96 strand, and the four inch conduit. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the difference is labor, 160 yeah. grand in labor. Can, can I sure. <laughs> add a little bit? Um, that, that original kind of back of the envelope number that we had talked about um, was a, what we originally asked for was just a, a materials number. And, and that materials number for, for the four inch max L conduit with the, with the fiber, and, um, and, and uh, you know, some hand holes here and there. Um, you're right, was that number that you talked about, maybe $30,000, $35,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. Then in meeting with um, the city uh, Department of Public Works folks, we thought, you know, let's, let's find out what it would cost to not just put in the backbone, but to make sure that there were um, handoffs in each of the buildings on Main Street so that so it would be easy for the re for the businesses that are tenanted in each of these buildings to be able to get it because we didn't want to have a situation where the city spent a bunch of money to put in this great bandwidth and then there was a tall cost for everybody who wanted to hook into it right. so we thought what's it going to cost to be able to put conduit with fiber with into fiber. every building between route 13 and mill street and so that increased the cost probably from the the, from the 30s to the mid 50s in order to accommodate that. And then um, 
uh, and then came in the question of um, the, the labor, the engineering, the professional services, the permitting, the, all the other things that go into um, the, the professional deployment of an infrastructure system. And that, as Amanda said, that's how we came to that larger, um, albeit budgetary figure. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that, that's how that, that, that's how those numbers changed. Well, as I understand it, when you're, when you're talking about putting in fiber, seven-eighths of the cost is in the, putting it in the ground. And since we already have it open, this is a fraction of what it would normally cost to cover that span. Right. And if there were not the streetscape project <coughs> right. starting from scratch, this project would be very, very expensive. I'll, right. I'll give you the example of that. We're, we're looking at a total cost of just under $200,000 for all of the streets in the Main Street Master Plan. So that's going from Route 13 to Mill Street on Main Street and then from Main Street to Church Street on Division Street. So about $200,000. Um, this does not include Fitzwater, though. It does not include Fitzwater, not this phase. Uh, if, if we were doing this as a standalone project, to replace all the sidewalks that we're going under would be over $1.1 million. And then that doesn't even include the, the pavement restoration for the laterals going across the street. So that $200,000 would easily be a, a million and a half or more once you have all the restoration. So um, it, it's, it's very true to say that this would not be affordable if we weren't already tearing up the entire main street from face of building to face of building. Um, the plan for this utility, the way the MOU is structured, is that the city would build it and Maryland Broadband would essentially then be solely responsible for all the maintenance and repairs and locating services of the network. So essentially the city will, will sell this to Maryland Broadband for the cost of a dollar, essentially. So it's not going to be a utility that the city's looking to run in the future. We're, we're looking to have the, the cooperative run that. Okay. And that's consistent with what Jake and I had spoken with you about initially in his yeah. first talks. Um, so the only thing that, that changed was those spurs, and that was something that I was wondering about. I thought might have contributed to part of it, but, and that number that you said that took it to about 50, uh, that was part of Indeed. our kind of rough estimate as well. But the rest of it, I didn't understand. I'm, obviously, I'm for it. That's why we brought it forward, and, and I think it's a, a, the time to do it uh, because mm -hmm we won't be able to afford and we wouldn't want to tear everything back up again uh, after we put this in and it does set us apart it makes us uh, gig ready and, and gigabit ready correct uh, make sure i get the bits and bytes right <laughs> gigabit ready and that that's a competitive advantage that not a lot of places around here have um, and could serve us very well but i'll open the floor for questions yeah i think um i support the broadband concept, and I think it's going to be good for attracting new businesses. However, I do have an issue. I believe that this project is going to be in 2016, but at time frame, fiscal year. Yes. And I see that when when is the money due? So this would actually be bid with the Main Street Master Plan project, phase by phase. So Maryland Broadband's helping us with the design, and then we will reflect that in the set of drawings that goes out for bid. So obviously that, that hasn't been done yet. We haven't directed AMT to change the plans at all because this is still under discussion. But so the money would actually be due uh, with the rest of the money when we're, when we're projecting to sign those contracts. Um, part of the reason it's before you now as a budget amendment uh, is, is I think from discussions with the finance director, there is money available in surplus to, to allocate funds that way and put it in a capital project account uh, so that it's ready for next year. From my from my perspective, I'll go on record that I am opposed to taking out of um, the surplus, and I would support it if we're uh, somehow into the budget for next year, personally. All right. I, I was wondering the same thing. Thank you for asking that question. Why why now and not in in the budget? Because this is slated to begin go to bid in October, correct? Um, we hope to start in October, but it's all this first phase is funded in fiscal year 16. Okay. So it, it could get added to the budget um, now, I guess, while the budget's in process right. and be funded with the rest. I, I think the discussion, and maybe that's what the finance director is, is would that be added to bonded debt or, uh, you know, the, what the administration was putting forward was to put it uh, out of surplus now instead of bonded debt later. But, I, again, we could get the finance director. Yeah, I mean, it, it, can, it could come out of surplus in the current year, it could come out of surplus in the in next year, or it could come out of bonded debt, which... Um, 
for a project of this magnitude and lifespan is probably more appropriate, mm -hmm. but that's a, a discussion that we can have. But I didn't see, I didn't know if there was some engineering piece of that or something that needed to happen now that we needed to take that. No, no, there's the not. Year. No, this $197,000 would be part of the construction contract. Bid yep. with the rest of it. I'm sorry. The only reason I could see for a budget amendment this year is if somehow among the monies that are already distributed to the appropriate departments, there was 197 or some portion thereof, a thousand available mm -hmm. to put towards this project at a current year budget of monies. But I doubt that's the case. <laughs> I don't think anybody's got 200,000 sitting in their budget that they haven't used or aren't planning to use. So um, I, I'm, I agree with Mr. Heath that, that I think is the better way to go. Ms. Shields, I have a question. question. I, since I'm not technical and really don't want to be technical, I try to be a John Doe or be average Joe citizen. I see here um, that uh, cities that invest in this infrastructure is areas that are stagnated either economically or socially. And my question is to anyone who can answer this, how would it benefit the citizens? I hear that downtown businesses have no problem with going downtown. I live off of Fitzwater Street. How would it benefit the citizens? I do see it's going to the port. I don't have a boat. So how would it benefit me if you're not coming down Fitzwater Street or the people even live at River's Edge? How would that utility benefit the average citizen? Mr. Answer that. Mr. Garrett has some right. response to, to that, but it does say that it says the Port Exchange building. Yeah. Uh, oh, the Port Exchange building. I'm thinking yeah. the Port I'm, I'm sorry. And it's, it's a draw for businesses. You can, either way, whatever you prefer. Port Exchange building. Okay. Yeah. It's all about drawing businesses to reduce the tax burden. I, I understand. One of the, um, the portions of the agreement says that the city of Salisbury is going to be given uh, 12 strands of fiber to do whatever we want to do with. Um, one of those ideas, um, the existing downtown Wi-Fi project that, that, that we are currently about basically finished with now, um, the mesh antennas are allowed to have a certain amount of hops, a certain amount of connections be between the various antennas before it gets back to our main building where um, the internet is actually being provided by the Maryland Broadband Cooperative already. So what this would allow us to do is take one of those strands, run it all the way out to essentially the last building as you get out towards Mill Street. Um, we could then put in a backbone connection there, which would allow us to spread the, the free internet throughout a larger area of the city over in the area that, they, that you're speaking of. So not only would it allow us to kind of expand the existing infrastructure, but it would, it would provide free internet to people that, that live on that side of town. Yeah, because it's stopping right at the bridge and not crossing it. Right, right. And, and if you go out to the I, marina, for instance. have a problem of progress. Right. Well, if, if, if we go out to the marina as a, a backbone yeah. location, that, that would open up a lot more area for us to, to run to. Because right now we're limited because the Maryland broadband drop is here in this building. Mm -hmm. But how are we going to sell that to the people? <laughs> well, it would be free for them. If, if It'd the, be free for downtown businesses. But no, 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 no. It'd be free I for mean, them as well. The, 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 the downtown Wi-Fi system, um, the one that's currently now just in the down, downtown corridor. But by expanding the base run out to the marina, giving us kind of a home run there, we would then okay. be, be able to sprawl out through, you know, through, through town if the administration decides that they, they want to go in that direction, you know, out into town that, that way. So the citizens would, would be able to receive free internet in the area, out in, in that side of town. How wide an area? It depends how many antennas we want to put in. A hundred. A hundred antennas? <laughs> Cover the entire town. <laughs> Go ahead, put something funny. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Spees, did you have anything else? No, I'm in, I'm in uh, you know, I think it's a great project. <laughs> we can get it going, that's great. Um, taking it out of surplus, I agree with you that I'm not really hot on that idea. But, mm -hmm. you know, we do what we do. And I also have a disclosure as well. If any of this is a corning product, if you're using corning. Oh, are, are we using corning? Yeah. Um, I think we took those those drop right? Why well, use corning wear? No, I, I'm a shareholder in some oh. corning products, so I just didn't want to have a conflict of interest here. Um, thank you. Just one more comment, and, and uh, I should have said it when I was 
talking about it that I'm for the project, but I think we also have to, as, as we're moving forward, we have to be conscious of our debt, our debt right. limits right. and, and look at that number and keep an eye on it because it's easy to do and just say we're going to have bonded debt. Mm -hmm. and, but I think that you know, we have the responsibility also to make sure that we, our ratings aren't affected, et cetera. Mm -hmm. This I don't believe will do that, but we know we have some issues we're going to have to take care of. Correct. Correct. Um, the, I agree. The, the one thing that we need to look at in addition to what, how much we're bonding, how much debt we're taking on is which of those things that we're taking on have a, a return on investment. And I think this has a tremendous a potential for a return on that investment multiple times, many, many, many times over. Um, I agree with you. The take rate is something that I, I hear a lot about. Um, I didn't get too deep in it, and that's how many people have to connect before you break even, but at $200,000 since we already have everything open, I don't imagine it's too many, but do you have an idea how many that would, would take? Um, the, um, in terms of uh, when the investment starts to use, uh, return money back to the city of two hundred thousand. Well, because you're going to own it, it's mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit different because we're, we're not looking at numbers of people subscribing and paying a monthly rate mm -hmm. to recoup that two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But uh, in terms of, so it would come back in property tax and and increase sales tax and those kinds of things. So it's probably no idea for for that portion for the city. But in terms of uh, Maryland broadband. I'm just trying to give a picture of how many people would have to connect to this uh, utility for two hundred thousand dollars benefit to be realized on an ordinary basis. Yeah. Well, it's you know it's um, it's, a, it's a very curious question because um, on on the one hand, it um, you know I know that there is a lot of interest amongst the the, the businesses here in the downtown uh, for services. However, it, it would either take a, a fair number of small customers or literally one, one large one, yeah. and, it would, and it would be all at once. And, and I think uh, we have one large one that is chomping at the bit yeah. to get a hold of it. Right. So yeah. it's, uh, it's you know, I don't mean, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer just right. because of how the business model is set mm -hmm. up. But, um, that, that's close enough. I think that okay. that's, that's kind of what people needed to know. What is, what are we looking at here right. in terms of um, how much benefit we get? Yes. Just as an example, uh, a town as small as 257 people in Wyoming has, they've built this infrastructure and they um, have a business that does, uh, teaches English to South Koreans and that has expanded their, you know, their community greatly. So, you know, the right. opportunities are there for right. whatever. Right. And we have a lot of entrepreneurial centers and a lot of people that are looking at downtown to set up more of those and, and startups and that kind of thing. And, and this is the kind of thing that draws them because that's, that's that competitive advantage others don't have. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, it's probably not my role to be aspirational on a thing like this, but one of the things that we talk about in broadband planning uh, that I've been involved with for a long time is a challenge of the shore in general has been, you know, we have all these great, smart young people who come in from all over mm -hmm. the eastern seaboard to get educated in Salisbury, and, and then they leave. <laughs> and wouldn't it be great if, if, uh, if we could just uptick the percentage of the ones that stay here and build businesses and raise families? Right. That, uh, anything we can do to support that, uh, that trend line, I think, would, uh, would, would pay off in a lot of different ways. Right. And even if they have a... Uh, <clears throat> pet grooming business that doesn't need the broadband for the business if they're living upstairs and they can get quicker access than anywhere else in the area that could be that could be enough just on a personal basis because everybody wants to be faster better more all the time so it's one of the the challenges that it, uh, that we have where um, uh, getting people the same access at home that they have whether it's school or work is, um, is, is a different way of measuring uh, equity Right. Yes. It'll make them stay at work a little later, right? <laughs> or do all their personal things at work. Well, um, I would ask if maybe the uh, the engineers for the Main Street project mm -hmm. are here to give us an update on that, 
if they had any comments about weighing in on that, I'm sure that you've been in contact with them and they, uh, sure. how and that's going to integrate. Sure. We talked about, we had a design meeting last week on Tuesday to go over the 95% design. And under the sidewalk already, we're running conduit for all the light poles and the, the parking meters. And that's going under the sidewalk more towards the curb line because that's where the lights are going. So in, in talking to AMT, this conduit would be better towards the back of the sidewalk where it's closer to the buildings and then it's not interfering with the other conduit. So um, they're aware this might be coming. We've talked about locations where it would work. Uh, when they see the Maryland broadband design and the different specs about depth and whatnot, then they'll look for conflicts and, and see how this will be able to go in. But we have talked about it and I think keeping it under the sidewalk for the main conduit is the right place to have it and we don't have many other utilities running there and this is a small conduit so it, it should work out okay. Okay. And when we, one of the things that came up to the meeting the other night when they presented the plan was the, the parking meters mm -hmm. and studying up for them if it was possible to run that fiber so that they're run off of that mm -hmm. so that we don't have Wi-Fi issues and connectivity issues that we would, it would run on that fiber line and, and um, be much quicker and more reliable. Okay. So, okay. Any other questions? So consensus of council to add this to our budget from this year, have that discussion about where, but, but to hold off on the budget amendment and to have, discuss it in the budget meeting. Yes. Okay. We have one more budget meeting on Thursday and it needs, we need to complete everything then just forewarned uh, Thursday three to six. So. Uh, and the MOU, uh, did you have any specific comments or questions on that, or do you want to take time to review that before it goes before legislative sessions? I reviewed it. I didn't have anything uh, specifically on that, um, but I think that it would be wise to hold off on that before we, until, until we, we figure out sure. where or how it's going to be funded. Sure. And Drew, I don't know if you want to, um, we have to become a, a member of the cooperative, if you want to explain that now. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, that uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the event that the, the city uh, chooses to contract with, uh, with Maryland Broadband for the construction piece, part of, part of our um, uh, formulation, our 501c12 tax designation, is that um, the preponderant majority of all of our revenues have to come from entities that are members of the Maryland Broadband Cooperative by IRS rules. So we've invited the city to, to look at our membership applications to become a, a member of the cooperative as a, as a governmental entity um, uh, so that we can have that relationship. Um, and, uh, <coughs> You know, there are a number of governments here in the state of Maryland that are members of the cooperative. I think I mentioned every, all 15 rural counties are members. There are a couple of municipalities that have become members. And so that's a, that's a, um, an administrative um, uh, activity that we would have to, that we would have to go through. But, um, you know, hopefully you'll view it the way we do. We're, we're an open access carrier, so we, we purposely have made the, the, uh, the hurdles to entry as low as possible. Um, but what it, what it does is it not only allows us to do business together, but it would also give the city of Salisbury, if it chose, uh, to have an equal access to all of Maryland broadband's assets across the state of Maryland, just like any other ISP or government or, or anything else. So it kind of gives you some flexibility for your future planning if you ever, if you ever decide to do more than what you're currently doing. Okay. Is there a fee for the for the membership? There is. It's a it's a it's not an annual fee. There's just a, a one time charge, uh, I believe, for governmental entities. It's um, fifteen hundred dollars. Okay. I don't think that'll hurt us too badly. <laughs> I think we could deal with that. <laughs> uh, okay. And gosh, something else popped in my mind, and then it popped right back out. Oh, in terms of the individual customers, just real quick, for for their knowledge, for the public knowledge as well as ours, how will they connect? Who will be their provider? How will that work once we've studied that to their building or, or spurred it, whatever you 
call it. Well, that's where I think that the, I think that the model will give downtown and, and wherever the network is built out to um, uh, a really great story to tell. Uh, Maryland Broadband is the, the wholesale uh, carrier that that will provide the services to the doorstep, but the the individual business that's residing in one of the tenant buildings here in the downtown um, will have an opportunity to buy the service that they get, their high-speed internet service, from any one of our members that chooses to provide services in the downtown. Um, as I said, we have um, uh, over 50 internet service providers that are members of our cooperative, and as opportunities come up, what we can do is we will um, we will inform our uh, our membership of, of where our the network has expanded to, and then as people and uh, businesses want to connect and get whatever service they want, we can publish that to 58 different ISPs or whatever the number actually is today, and those will those uh, ISPs will compete to provide the service directly to the end use customer. Okay. So that's what I was saying earlier that when. Maryland Broadband gets involved in, a, in an area. It's not just a new participant. It's it's more than 50 new participants. Right, right. Which is in competition is good for yeah. everybody. And the <laughs> other thing is, um, is that it's it's not the worst thing that ever happened for incumbent providers that are already here because uh, you know um, by and large, um, uh, although we don't speak specifically about individual members of our cooperative based on our bylaws, but. Um, you know, if, uh, if they're an ISP also, they would have an opportunity to, to leverage this asset also and improve the quality of services that they're bringing. Okay. You said you we're going to run the cable down the sidewalks or under the sidewalks closer to the buildings. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that we have to run down both sides of the street? We're, we're going to cross across with main lines and then have a handhold that then services branch off of that. Okay. So we'll have, you know, a couple crossings each block across the street okay. and, and handholds across there. And I guess I should mention, too, we didn't say this before, the four-inch conduit is more than adequate. We're not coming anywhere near using all the space in right. the four-inch conduit. So there is room for expansion in future right and it's easy to feed easier to feed that through there yes. um, when the conduits already there and has extra yes, space exactly if you need an extra width mm -hmm. so, yeah. I guess that's the right work with bandwidth the fiber no, that's not really bandwidth anyway <laughs> if you need more cables you need more, yeah. fiber. <laughs> more fiber <laughs> okay thank you very much I appreciate it Pleasure. good to see you again good to see you and that took care of our second item too glad to see that, that, was that the first two items. Come. <laughs> Thank you all Those very much. first two Thank items. You. Yes. Okay. Let me get back to my agenda. Sorry. The MOU. Yes. Wait. This is the wrong one. That's the special meeting. I don't need that one open. We already did that. Apologies. Okay. <laughs> Try again. All right, now we have the Main Street Master Plan update. Yes, so this is the 95% design update, so we're, we're getting close on our details and uh, hope to show you some of the final design. I'm going to have Except Paul. the ones we keep changing. I know. <laughs> Paul will introduce the team and give you a little overview. Sure. Hi, Paul. Thank, thank you, Amanda. Welcome. It's great to be here. So we have uh, Kathy Walsh and Steve Torgerson here from AMT. Uh, they've done a great job working with us on the Excuse Main Street me. Master Plan. Kim, could you Go turn on. the projector back yes. on, please? They have prepared a really nice PowerPoint for us, and hopefully we'll be able to see it, because uh, that's a you know, big part of this project is visuals. Right. But we are we're currently wrapping up the design right now. We're at 95%. Uh, moving towards 100% completion, and um, we'd like to get council's feedback on some items. See the other one there. So network cord. I'm going to restart the computer and um, Maybe it'll see if it recognizes. It see if it will recognize it. That's what we did last time. Okay. Yeah. But our, our next steps, just to get to the, the end piece while we're restarting that, uh, for the next submittal, AMT will be breaking it into the three bid packages. Everything we've had so far has been one large set of plans that covers the entire area. 
but the next submittal will actually give us the bid packages because as you know we're bidding the first piece would be from Route 13 to just east of Division Street on Main Street so we'll actually have those those pieces that will go out to bid over the next three years so that's uh, the next submittal which will be due in late June so with that we'll be ready to go out for bid in July or August once the the bonds are ready to go in the new fiscal year so we're still targeting starting construction hopefully in October notice to proceed in October <coughs> and I'll also a little background last Tuesday night uh, so some of you know we had a meeting with the different committees we met with the traffic and safety advisory committee the bicycle and pedestrian uh, safety committee and the Central City District Commission to get their input on the 95% plans. It went very well. We had good turnout at the meetings, so we had a lot of uh, public input and comments. So we will be incorporating some of those comments into changing in the plans. But for the most part, it was buy-in from those various committees that are looking at pedestrian and bicycle and, and traffic issues. So we went, went through and walked through the traffic plans with those committees so they could see and understand uh, what's going to be occurring, occurring as far as maintenance of traffic. Yeah. visual yes. dependent yes <laughs> I could attempt to do an interpretive dance associated with it but I don't know if we would do it justice <laughs> Yeah, on East Main Street, we're going to do the, the, from Route 13 to Division Street will be the first piece we construct. Yes. Oh, that, there's our problem. Which one is it? Which one? What is it that connects to? It's a computer connection, right? Yes. Which I'm assuming it's not the HDMI. Tried to. You tried to before, and that didn't work, so just run down the line. Yeah, yeah it's not the HDMI, no. No, but it wouldn't matter. They should be able to see my screen. I could also try to shut down some Here's the Get plugged into it. Oops. Yeah, no, it's on. It's projecting. Um, I think the county needs to get a new projector. Take a five-minute break uh, so we can fix this, and, and uh, yeah. we'll be back in just.